Oof, it's been a rough one, my friends. Um, so let me tell you why part two is coming over 24 hours late. Um, sorry about that. Um, it started with um, electrical problems in the house. We had to have an electrician in, and uh, that kept me from getting this recorded and uploaded, and I apologize for that. Uh, and I've just been working on recording part two, and I've lost a good chunk of the lecture. I got it recorded, and then, you know, technical glitch, the file went corrupt. Um, basically, the the app that I use for recording these um, crashed in the middle of the lecture and we couldn't recover. Um, so that said, my apologies. I'm sorry for yet another excuse on being late. At least this one's a good one. I wasn't just being lazy. Um, but what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about detectors in gas chromatography. So we're going to talk about uh, GC detectors. And we're going to talk about four categories of detector. Um, it's not by any stretch uh, everything you'll ever see in detection in GC, but I think it's going to cover most of the bases. I think this will get you in the literature um, pretty quickly, and I think it'll cover the overwhelming majority of literature you're likely to, to look at. So the first one we're going to talk about is thermal conductivity detection, or TCD. Uh, TCD is a fairly simple concept. I want you to imagine you have a flow cell and into that flow cell you send um, flow from the column. So this is the, the element. This is what's coming off of the column. So either the, just the pure carrier gas if there's no peak at that given time or it's a mixture of the carrier gas and the, the analyte uh, that corresponds to that peak. Okay, built into this flow cell is a resistive heater. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, it's just basically a high resistance piece of wire. And if you apply a voltage across this thing, let's go plus voltage, minus voltage here, you're going to induce uh, a certain amount of current to flow through this circuit all the way through. And that is going to produce heat. There's some little squiggly heat lines. Um, so the, uh, the thing you need to know is that uh, the current is constant. Right, so the circuitry is designed to deliver a constant value of current at all times. Um, and uh, that might, means the amount of thermal energy this thing can produce per unit time is also constant. Um, so we should say that current is proportional to the amount of heat that's being produced. And you also need to know that the gas flow over the heater acts to dissipate the heat. In other words, uh, the gas picks up thermal energy by changing its temperature, but it continues to flow on, right? So it takes thermal energy away from this heater, which allows the heater to continue producing more thermal energy without burning up. Okay, um, so straightforward. Um, actually, let's let's take this concept one, one step further. So we say uh, the gas flow dissipates, uh, acts, to dis acts to dissipate heat, and it does so Let's say that our heat dissipation is proportional to the specific heat of the um, gas mixture that's flowing over the heater. Uh, so specific heat, I'll remind you, this is a concept from, from GenChem, um, is the idea of how much energy it takes um, per unit mass to come to increase the temperature of that gas by some by one degree c basically um, so as the specific heat goes up this thing gets uh, a lot more effective per unit mass at picking up heat and taking it away so that heat will dissipate faster when the specific heat of the gas mixture coming off the column is greater and it'll dissipate less when the specific heat is lower so let's look at the relationship between voltage and current. It's a very straightforward one that you probably learned about uh, as, as an undergrad in a physics class or if you've done any electronics. Uh, that relationship is called Ohm's law. Ohm's law tells us that a voltage that's applied to a circuit uh, is equal to the amount of current that is induced to flow through that circuit times the resistance of that total circuit. Um, and here's the thing that we need to uh, keep in mind. We need to keep in mind that this is constant. The circuitry upstream of this plus voltage, the stuff feeding voltage is designed to make sure that this stays constant. 
And the second thing you need to know is that the resistance of this resistive heater uh, is proportional essentially to its um, to its temperature. Um, so uh, inversely proportional to its temperature. The important part to know is that uh, the resistance will change as our ability to carry heat away from this thing will change. And so let's tie these ideas together. So heat dissipation, this causes, uh, this causes resistance to vary. Right, so the resistance in the circuit will vary as a function of how well the gas can carry heat away from the resistive heater. That necessarily means if you have a constant in terms of varying factor, you get a variable uh, signal right here. You get if you measure what voltage it takes to drive that constant amount of current um, in a dynamic system where the resistance is changing, um, the voltage you need will change. And because this thing changes as a function of the specific heat of this gas, it's basically saying it will change as the gas composition changes. And the gas composition changes when there is a peak or not a peak present, right? And ideally proportional to how much uh, extra material is present in that peak. So um, the thing that you should know is that specific heat is a property of the whole mixture coming out of this thing, kind of like refractive indexes in, um, in liquid chromatography. That means that um, as we've described this before, that makes this a universal detector. It's not specific for any molecular properties. It will detect anything in solution in that gas. Um, it is also a concentration sensitive detector, which means that we should be describing limit of detection in terms of concentration. And we're going to say that this is um, tens. We're going to say limits of detection here are on the order of tens to hundreds of micromolar typically so in the grand scheme of things these are not great limits of detection the 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 beauty of this detection method comes in the fact that it's universal um, has a linear range again not great so uh, linear range of we're gonna say four to five decades or four to five orders of magnitude um, so that doesn't really compare with most optical methods. This doesn't really compare with most optical methods, but it is a nice universal way of seeing everything coming off your column. So that's our, our TCD, our thermal conductivity detector. Um, let's move on to what might be, if you're not using mass spec, um, I think this next method is probably by far the most common. I think mass spec is starting to become the most common detection mode in GC. But if you're not doing mass spec, um, this one is a biggie. So this is called flame ionization detection or FID. Okay, so here's how FID works. Uh, we have a column, we have flow coming off the column. So let's call this from the column. So this is gonna be either our carrier gas or um, or our carrier gas plus our analyte to make a peak. Uh, and we're gonna inject that flow into this environment between two electrodes. Uh, so let's call this plus voltage and minus voltage. And in this area between these two electrodes, we're gonna have uh, a flame as the name would suggest. My artistry is not great, but let's assume that that's a flame. It's actually a really hot flame. This isn't a, usually an acetylene flame, it's the same type of fuel acetylene is the same fuel they use for um, welding steel for example so it's a really really hot flame the idea is that the the carrier gas or the sample are going to come into this flame and that flame is going to completely obliterate your sample molecule so let's make our first point here that this is a destructive detect detector that's not so bad in GC because we rarely use GC as a preparative technique. We're rarely collecting anything here. We don't really care if it gets destro destroyed because the whole point is just to analyze what's in there. Okay, in the process of being destroyed in this flame, um, the, the end products are going to be these um, very small chain, usually one carbon carbocations, right? So this produces... Um, 
carbocations, usually one carbon carbon cations, they're probably not just C plus, they're probably CH2 plus or something on that order. But the idea is it contains one carbon and it is a cation. Um, because it's a cation and there's an electric field here, uh, it's going to feel, you know, it's positively charged, it's going to feel, feel repelled by that and attracted by that. And so what's going to happen is these things are going to hit the electrode. So what happens when a positive charge hits a piece of metal? Well, a, an electron comes to meet it, to neutralize it, right? The flow of electrons is current. Uh, and so when we see the carbocations are accelerated, and here, let's put a little detection thing here. We're gonna measure amps coming off of this thing. So an amp meter, um, the, the carbocations are accelerated to the detection electrode um, producing measurable current. Okay. Um, something you should know about that measurable current, and it kind of follows from the mechanism we just talked about. Um, if I have one molecule of ethane, uh, it's going to produce uh, two of these car two of these single carbon carbocations. Uh, if I have one molecule of butane, it's going to produce four of them, right? That's that's twice the signal for butane versus ethane, even though in both cases it was just one molecule of each. Um, that means that our signal by flame ionization detection is proportional uh, to the number of carbons in the analyte. It becomes a lot easier to measure um, larger molecules this way. Of course, the size of our molecules is limited by the fact that we're working in GC to begin with. So large, very large molecules don't go into, into the gas phase easily. Um, so it is selective, sort of, uh, but it's selective for carbon containing molecules. Um, and that's not that selective. Let's be honest. What I want you to kind of brainstorm the type of molecule you're going to do um, GC on that is, is not carbon containing, right? There actually are some people use GC as gas analysis for um, all sorts of, of gases, uh, and most of those uh, don't contain carbon. Uh, but that's about it. Just about anything else you're going to look at is going to be a carbon containing molecule. Uh, it is a mass sensitive detector. Um, let's see how we know that. We talked when we talked about mass sensitivity versus concentration sensitivity. We said if you try to measure every molecule in the sample, you're probably mass sensitive. You're going to take the entire sample, you're going to obliterate the entire thing, and you're going to try and catch all of these electrons onto this electrode. Sorry, all of these carbocations onto this electrode, uh, and therefore it's trying to measure everything. It's mass sensitive. Um, we see limits of detection here on the order of we'll say one to 10 picograms. It's a little bit confusing. If you look these up, uh, you'll see limits of detection not reported in picograms. You'll see them reported in picograms per second. Um, it actually, this actually makes a lot of sense. Um, picograms per second. Uh, current is a measure of electrons per second, right? Um, so if we say picograms, we're talking about the picograms of carbocation that are produced, or the picogram, actually it's picograms of sample that go in to produce carbocations. Um, and if we're measuring that as current, well, we have to integrate that current over some amount of time because we're counting electrons per unit time. So anyways, the point is you look this up, you're going to see picograms per second. That's going to be confusing. If you just assume that your measurement interval is one second, then one to 10 picograms per second becomes a limited detection of one to 10 picograms. Uh, linear range is pretty good here. So linear range for flame ionization detection is going to be somewhere on the order of six to seven decades for a good modern instrument. All right, that's flame ionization detection, by far the, the, the biggest if you're not talking about mass spec. Let's look at one more kind of, um, kind of niche, but these are out there. This is, uh, this is called an electron capture detector or ECD. 
And one thing I don't want you to confuse this with, if you are a mass spectrometrist or if you, have, if you like the mass spec literature, there's a technology in mass spec called ECD that is not actually all that different from what we're going to talk about um, that is not this. In mass spec, that stands for electron capture dissociation. Here we're using a somewhat similar mechanism um, to do electron capture detection. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, I guess I'll draw it from top down this time. Here's flow coming from your column. And it's going to enter this, this space here. Um, and in this space, we have uh, some source of beta particles. And that is usually uh, nickel 63. So nickel 63 undergoes um, decay to produce a beta particle. A beta particle is just a really fast moving electron. Uh, and so what happens is that fast moving electron collides with uh, typically nitrogen gas. That's either from the carrier gas or the atmosphere. This thing's at atmospheric pressure. It's actually a little below atmospheric pressure, I think, but there's atmosphere in there. So this thing collides with um, this fast moving electron collides with nitrogen gas to eject another electron. And so what you get is um, an ionization of the of the fast moving gas. Um, plus a couple of much slower moving electrons. The original electron moving slower now because it gave up some of its energy and the second electron that was knocked out of here to, to produce this. Okay, this electron is um, a little bit off center here, but that's okay, we'll, we'll deal with it. It's accelerated towards um, an electrode. How is it accelerated? Well, the same way we typically accelerate which is which would be to apply like a plus voltage here plus attracts negative electrons are now we have this kind of mechanism that produces a, a steady stream of electrons going this way um, we apply a potential so this is the circuit signal for a battery plus and minus to ground and we're going to measure in there the amperage uh, so we're going to measure the amount of electrons flowing through this circuit so when these electrons are accelerated here they enter this circuit, they flow this way towards the ultimately the positive charge come from the battery, and we measure them as current. So with nothing coming out of our column, um, we have this sort of steady state current, right? When a peak comes out of here, especially um, a uh, an electrophilic peak. So this is, um, let's start here. Let's say that this ECD mode is selective, and it's selective for electrophiles. Um, a really good example of this really common use for this thing is to look at halogenated species. And actually we can think about this in contrast to the flame ionization detector. Halogenated species are actually really hard to burn. Um, they're really hard to oxidize. Uh, this is why they're so expensive to dispose of in the lab, is why you have a special container for halogenated species, because they can't just go in the incinerator. So halogenated species are not great for detection by flame ionization detection. That's why modes like this work. So the idea is the flow from the column is going to kind of, again, I said I'm off center here. That's why we're going at an angle. But it's going to flow through this sort of steady stream of electrons. Right? These are all electrons being accelerated this way. And when the electroph electrophilic species like halogenated species come off of the column, they are going to essentially capture, hence the name electron capture, some of these electrons, and that will reduce the amount of current going through our detection circuit. So um, electro uh, electron capture by these electrophiles. Uh, reduces reduces sorry about that guys reduces current uh, in the detection circuit okay uh, let's see if there's anything else to say about this except for its properties so we've already said that this is a selective detector, not a universal detector, and it's typical for halogenated species. Um, I should tell you that it's a concentration sensitive 
detector, um, just to draw the kind of the same analogy we did when we talked about FID, there is no guarantee that every single molecule coming through here interacts with an electron, right? We want a representative sample, a representative cross section of sample that we have interacting with electrons. That means it's concentration sensitive. Um, we see typical LODs on the order of, um, we'll say the mid, so mid nanomolar. So it's pretty darn sensitive. It's a pretty darn sensitive detection. Oh, the place where it really lacks is linear range. So this thing has a linear range on the order of about four orders of magnitude, four decades. So it's not a very robust, um, broad methodology for, um, for detection. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do here, guys. I am actually going to split this into a part three. Um, we want to talk about mass spec, um, and we don't have too much to say about mass spec detectors, but I'm going to give them their own video because we're hitting 20 minutes right now, and um, we'll come back with a very short part three that is mass spec detectors.